Uh, let's talk about Chelsea now, shall we? Of course, through to the semi-finals of the FA Cup after that victory against Leicester. But to find them in the Premier League table, you have to go all the way down to 11th. Even when they win, they somehow muck things up, as obviously they did uh, at the weekend against Leicester. This is what a fan group has said uh, about the frustrations within the supporters groups at the moment. The feeling that the club has become a laughing stock both on and off the pitch is growing. Unless the situation improves, this seems likely to manifest itself in more targeted chanting, especially at televised games. Let's welcome in James Olley. James, you were at Stamford Bridge for that game against Leicester. Can you just talk us through the atmosphere and what led to it? Yeah, well, look, I mean, I wrote in the piece I did from the game that it, it, the atmosphere was almost like a referendum on Pochettino's future. There was, it was, there was conversation going on in the stands and, you know, reminiscent of other clubs and thinking it's, it goes on a lot at West Ham games around David Moyes. You can sort of hear when the team's not playing with any real conviction or any kind of quality, they, they just start talking amongst themselves and, and, and they're sort of clearly thinking, are, are we on board with this? Are we not? And, you know, Chelsea play in such snatches. They play in moments. They play in periods of the of the game where um, they they make you believers for ten minutes, and then they suddenly they regress, and then there's a problem in the game, and they concede a cheap goal, and obviously it was a comical own goal. Or they'll they'll put a piece of good play together and they'll score, and then they'll win a penalty, and then Sterling will miss it, and you kind of don't really know what you're going to get next. And I, I think. I think the Chelsea fans have had enough of the uncertainty, really. And and what I think we're seeing, particularly with that statement as well, is there's such a vacuum at the top of the club now in terms of what is the direction. You know, we don't hear from Todd Bowley. We don't hear from Ben Arnick Barley and, and Clear Lake Capital. It's only Pochettino who's really out there trying to make sense of a lot of decisions that, let's be honest, have been taken either before he came in or they're still made above him now. And I think that lack of clarity and that lack of understanding of what is the bigger picture, yes, we've spent this money, but where are we going, is, is, is leading to this space that's being filled with a lot of this negativity. And because the team are not playing with that clarity either, I think this is a fan base that is looking at a, a, a team and a club, supported a club for 20-odd years that, that knew if things were not going well, the manager would be changed ruthless decisions would be made mm. and that team if it wasn't at the top wouldn't be far away with those changes unfortunately now they have no sort of certainty about what is coming next what is you know from minute to minute even within the games let alone the bigger picture about where they're going as a club going forward and now how audible was the booing that you heard of sterling yeah it was bad um, it was bad. I mean, it, it, it reached a real nadir when, when he took that free kick in the second half. But by the time Sterling came off, it, it almost felt a bit of a relief for everyone, really, that he just he was having such a, a nightmare afternoon. Yes, he had the assist for the second goal. Again, a good moment, but really in a, in a wider collective malaise, it was lost in everything else. And yeah, it's, it, it's really toxic there at the moment. And you can just feel, and I think the players know it. I think it's why when they're 2-0 up in that game, you know, they look so fragile. The minute something goes against them, they concede and then it's 2-2 and suddenly they're on the back foot and the game becomes a kind of basketball match and could go either way. There's not that sense of control, of, of sort of inner calm and composure um, that, that would enable them to have the game management to get them through these situations. And it does really feel like it's on a knife edge for Pochettino at the moment. And all, all these all these negativities, are, to, to James's point there, are making making things much more unstable for the manager. Because, as we've discussed many times and we've all, and we've all seen it, when, these, when, when a supporter's turn in big numbers, the, obviously we've talked about Raheem Sterling getting it and that's, we all, most of us think it was pretty unacceptable because uh, players have bad days at the office. He's not said he doesn't want to play for the club, uh, doesn't want to be at the club, but he certainly did not have a particularly good game. But when these large groups of supporters turn, it starts to resonate, you would think, with investors and ownership. And they're only going to turn one way. They're only ever going to turn one way. And the only thing that takes it away, whether the club has been run properly or not, or whether the, the, the fans have been liaised with properly and the communication is, is not the best... That kind of goes away somewhat if you're getting results. Mm -hmm. But when you put... And, and they've had some good results, not many, but some, Carabao Cup final. 
FA Cup semi-final now, where unfortunately for them, they've got Man City. But if this continues and gets worse, then Todd Bowley and all those cohorts that are at Stamford Bridge, they're going to start feeling the ire of these supporters and then it's going to fall back on one head yep. and one head only, and that's Pochettino. Here's the, here's the issue with, with everything at Chelsea for me. Um, and, and I understand the fans' frustrations. Before, and the fans are going to take it out on the players and the manager because they are the ones on the pitch and on the sidelines on match days. But I do not believe you can consistently put out a good product on the park when there is, and to, to use James's term, when there's this vacuum of leadership at, at, at the top. Um, and, and that's what you've seen ever since Todd, Todd Bowley and clearly Capital have taken over. The first year, Bowley was, was seeing a lot, but... Uh, oftentimes contradicting himself. The all-star game, wasn't it? I, I mean, it, it was, it was, it was, it, it made Chelsea a laughing stock because of what he's seeing. And now he's gone the 180 degrees the other way and, and not seeing anything. And, and that's leaving, that's leaving Pochettino in, in a really awful position because he's getting no help from the top. It's translating into results at the bottom. And, and he now somehow has to, has to fill that void, and 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 he can't. And to, I mean, those are three very good managers that we're looking at there, and under Todd Bowley and, uh, and, and his, his leadership at, at Chelsea, who have all struggled. And there's one consistent, and that's the ownership. And for me, they have to bear the brunt of the brain. And you know, if you remember, but I actually questioned the mindset and thought process of him taking this job. I, I, I did, I thought, yeah, 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 I mean, it's big money, it's yeah. back into to elite level management, it's the Premier League, you, you, all that sort of stuff. But then you looked at it from the outside and you looked at the scattergun approach that was there, the undermining of Graham Potter, the decision-making that was made left, right and centre, that just seemed to be, uh, everything was sort of off the cuff and impulsive. And you just wondered at the, the mindset of him thinking that he could come in, and I suppose every manager does, and they think, oh, I, I can make the difference. Thus far, he hasn't really, and I think you now look at some of the managers that are leaving or being fired, and it might have been better off for him to sit back, take stock, and bide his time, but he threw himself back in, knew what he was getting himself into, because he had a bit of time to, to before he, he, he went into the hot seat when he knew he was getting it, and, and uh, he's suffering the same fate as the manager that was before him. Frank, what do you make of everything going around your former club at the moment? Uh, it's hard to always speak, you know, the last, but I... Uh... Oh. Frank's waited all this time to talk, and then... <laughs> <laughs> his internet froze. <laughs> froze. <laughs> his internet's frozen. Uh, Frank, let's try again. Yeah, yeah, do you hear me now? Yes. Do you hear me now? Yeah. OK, um... I, I, um... I understand the fans, and I always said, you know, uh, the frustration comes from the fact that they're getting impatient, and it's only fair. And we say, we, the club is Chelsea. Chelsea cannot wait two, three, or four years to settle down and to wait for the inexperienced players to, to get better. So when they see on top of it the experienced player like Sterling not doing well, they get angry. And on top of it, they cannot, they cannot reach the top. I mean, they cannot, the fans, they cannot yell at Mr. Boyley and his colleague. They, he, he, so they go for a lower level, so they go to uh, Pochettino and they go to the players now. But they want to show their frustration and their rage against the, the board who brought the club there. Don't forget that Chelsea, before Zola, Di Matteo, Viali, uh, Marcus Sain and Craig Burley, the club didn't win for more than 20 years, they didn't win anything. So they don't want to go back to that generation who has been frustrated for two decades. So they want to win the club, they can't re re cannot reach them, so they, they hit on, the, on who they can see. Pochettino first, where I think it's not fair, even if, I, as Craig said, you know, he knew what would uh, happen, what, what could happen to him, but I think it's not fair because he, he already had the problem and the players now. So it's, uh, it's an unbearable uh, problem because it not, it's not going to be resolved next year, not even the year yeah. after, be, be because of the player that they have. Yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? You're looking for any sort of light at the end of the tunnel. It's diff difficult to sell that to Chelsea fans, James. 
Yeah, and you know they've backed themselves into a corner with with financial fair play because of the way that they've spent their money and, and the underperformance of the team. So it's not as if they can just buy their way out of this. I mean, there's also an argument that they might not even be able to afford to sack Pochettino and his coaching staff because of the money that that will cost. He's only got a year left. He only ever signed a two year contract. But you're still talking about maybe I don't know the exact numbers, but you'd be talking ten, maybe fifteen million when you bring in the backroom staff as well to to sack all of them. And that is money that they don't have. They're going to have to sell players um, this summer and probably before June the 30th to try and make sure that they comply with the PSR rules, the FFP rules, um, to make sure they're not in breach and they face a final, maybe a points deduction. So it's not a case of Chelsea in the past where maybe they've underperformed under the old regime and the Abramovich regime and they've gone, right, here's the checkbook, let's go and spend. They, they can't, they've done it. They've already done it. They've spent the big money. And look, the, the problem they've got, I think, is They've changed everything at that club. They've changed, obviously, the ownership. They've changed the hierarchy. They've changed the staff. They've changed the manager. They've changed almost the entire playing squad. But they haven't changed the fans. And this is where this comes back to. The fans are used to this team Mm. winning. And if they don't win, it's rectified quickly. They never heard from the past owner. Abramovich barely did an interview, I think, in 20-odd years of of running that club. But they knew what would happen. If a manager underperformed, if that squad had holes that needed filling, they would fill it, they would change the manager, and they would get back to the top of the game and be competing for the major prizes. The problem they've got, Chelsea, these days is there's so many voices behind the scenes. There's co-owners, there's co-sporting directors. They've just hired a new loans manager. They've got analytics teams. They've got scouts. They've got all these people feeding into it. Pochettino is another voice voice throwing in and these decisions are being made in this kind of haphazard way and because they've already spent the money and because Todd Bowley and Benadek Bali are not coming out publicly and speaking and saying okay look we've spent a lot but this is the vision this is where we're trying to get to we understand Pochettino we support him we understand the short-term problems but this is where we're going as a long-term plan that is creating an absolute malaise that is leaving these fans to think well we don't really know what our club is anymore because when the owner was silent before, we still knew what we were going to get. And they go through the gates at Stamford Bridge every week and they do not know from one week to the next what that team is going to produce. It's, it's consistent only in its inconsistency. And as Craig was saying earlier, you know, it will eventually come back to Pochettino because they've exacerbated that pressure on the manager by dishing out six, seven, eight, nine-year contracts to these players. So it's not as if, you know, if you're a player sat there, Craig, if you're a player sat there on seven-year deal and the, and, the, and the club say, well, actually, we might think about moving you on next summer, you're going to go to any prospective club and say, well, I want a six-year contract. You're not going to give up six years' money, are you? You'd never do it. Frank, you know, you guys have all played the game. You would not give up six years' money easily having been given that six, sure. seven, eight-year contract in the first place, it's going to make it so much harder to move these players on. So if you sack the manager, whatever new manager comes in, he's going to have to deal with this same group of players. And then it comes back to, well, is the recruitment good enough? Are these players actually good enough to go and win the league, to go and win the Champions League, which is ultimately I, um, where they see them being? Uh, I have, I have an idea for, for the fans. You know, if they want to be listened by, by the board, don't go to Stamford Bridge anymore. Don't go for one, two, three games. Don't go, and you will see something's going to happen. When you're going to face empty, empty stands, you know, and uh, the media is going to talk about it, it's going to be a, a, a kind of a riot. Uh, the silence can be very loud sometimes. And if you don't show up, if you're all the fans, all the Chelsea crazy fans, they don't show up, the problem is going to be shown to the world. And Bolly and the others, they're going to, they will have to talk. They will have to talk. They, they, it would be compulsory. Wow. Do you remember Chelsea Frank- legend Frank LeBeouf says don't go to Stamford Bridge. Well, if you sign a seven or eight year contract and a seven year and they try and get you out and they try to force you and play all these games, which I'm not suggesting they're, they're doing, but, but it, it has happened, you're not going to get that somewhere else because nobody else is, is stupid enough. Mm. Uh, but then you're looking at asking Chelsea to pay two or three years of your contract and it becomes a a game of chess. <laughs> Everything is bad for Chelsea at the end yeah. of every story. Well, you go back to Frank, just briefly go back to Frankie de Jong at Barcelona. We know Barcelona were in, uh, had their, and still are having financial uh, problems, but do you remember they really tried to force him out mm-hmm. to get money so they could move in a different direction? And Frankie de Jong, international footballer, said, no, 
No. Yeah, and, and by the way, they belittled him in the media, on the radio, on the TV, in front of the fans. The fans would be turning up at the training ground, they'd be booing. And Frankie de Jong said, I am not going to bow to this pressure. And that's what these Chelsea players will do. They'll try and put pressure on them, possibly some of them that they've realised they've made mistakes on, and they may try and get them out. But it's, it, whether we agree or not, when, once that player signs the contract, it is not his problem. Mm. Right, and as long as he's keeping himself professional, as long as he's making himself available, and as long as he's doing the, doing his best, it is his choice if he wants to see that contract out. So it seems to me, and we know this has happened anyway, they've just swanned in here when they did this ownership. Todd Bowley and all the investors, the cohorts, Clear Lake Capital, all these people, and went, we know what we're doing, this is how we're going to do it. And they have made a complete balls up of it thus far. Uh, James, thank you very much. I feel that was one of your more optimistic appearances on the show. Um, <laughs> what does international break have in store for you? <laughs> don't, don't get me on to talk about a London team that's won Premier League at the bottom half of the table. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I'm, um, I'm, with, uh, I'm with England. So I'm England-Brazil and then England-Belgium. So, um, yeah, two big games for, for Gareth Southgate. Uh, lovely. Thank you very much, James, as always.